Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in Hawaii? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And I want to say a special hello to my mom and dad who drove up to be with us today. Amen.
bless you. house of the Lord together. Amen. We're looking forward to the day when we get to do this, when we can give each other a hug Amen. and uh, or a handshake. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I've said this before, that you guys need to be uh, ready because I'm a hugger. Yeah. I give bear hugs. <laughs> so if your spine is out of alignment, <laughs> I'll pop you back in. Until then, uh, we just continue to follow the guidelines that are put put out and that we can still worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. And uh, we can still praise his name and, and uh, bless his name. Amen. to everlasting you are God Amen. and uh, we do serve a great Lord and a great Savior Amen. he's unchanging his love and his mercies they're new every morning and he's always faithful and uh, in these tough times in which we live he just wants us to trust him right he knows the end from the beginning if, uh, if you find that uh, in these difficult days that you're afraid 
or that you're overcome by anxiety. You have a Savior who sympathizes with you. He doesn't want any of us living in fear. The Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, a spirit of love and a power and a sound mind. Keep trusting Him. Keep looking to Him. And when you find yourself slipping into worry, it's time to crank up those praise tunes and sing at the top of your lungs. Yes. And give Him praise and glory. Praise the Lord. We've got so many reasons uh, to serve the Lord. And uh, I'm sure if I were to give time, we could get all kinds of different reasons. So for whatever your reasons are for praising the Lord, keep that in mind as, uh, as we do this song. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship His soul. Take a few 
moments as our little places for us a few times. Just take some time in your own words, your own little song of praise, if you will. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Precious Jesus. Then he succeeded. That's right. God wants you to keep your focus on him. That's right. The Bible says whom the sun sets free is free. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. You believe that even in the midst of restrictions? Yeah. Yeah. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know about you folks, but I ain't gonna stop praising his name. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. We began our uh, worship portion today by singing about the resurrection. That's the greatest day of history, folks. And the most attested fact of history, Jesus Christ walked from that grave alive. King of kings, Lord of lords, King forever. Yes, Lord. And so we're going to end our worship portion today by singing about the resurrection.
Amen. Amen. We had a great uh, time last evening uh, giving no candies. Um, each bag was, uh, was filled really to, to the brim with candy. We also put a little uh, a track in there about what it means to place faith and trust in Jesus. And so we just pray that, uh, that those little seeds of the gospel, that God will water, that God will uh, germinate, that God will make it to grow. <clears throat> Altogether, we gave out, I believe, 53 bags to uh, children last night. Yeah, amen. And um, because of your generous donations of candies, almost every child, when they saw the size of the bag, uh, couldn't believe it. <laughs> uh, lots of comments, and there were even a few that, uh, comments that were made that I can't repeat here. <laughs> but uh, so we just trust that uh, those will go forward and that, that those folks uh, feel the love of Christ. Now we have a few bags left over. And so kids, if you're here today, this is a very fortunate day to be in church because when you uh, leave today, you can help yourself to a bag, okay? Take them home and uh, <laughs> drive your mom and dad crazy. <laughs> All right. Also just uh, want to wish uh, Carl and Julie a happy anniversary. And I believe their anniversary is tomorrow, 50, and we're 52 years. John and Paul meet today. Woo! Happy anniversary, guys. And uh, yeah, how many years for you? 34, we're just young. 34, all right. Amen. Paul needs it very patiently. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, if you have your Bible or your device with you, go ahead and go to the book of James. For the past six weeks, we've been in a series through the book of James. We're going to keep going. And uh, we're going to take a pause from it through the, the season of Advent to focus on on uh, the birth of Jesus, the coming of Christ to the earth through the through uh, the four Sundays of, uh, of Advent, and then we'll resume this again after that until we're finished. But we're looking at a faith that works, a faith that works when life doesn't. And you know as well as I do that life has always been working very well for the last seven or eight months. Uh, so what we're looking at is is uh, is how God tells us to act, to respond, to think, to believe, and to feel when we're in the midst of a crisis. How do you deal with the emotional problems and, and the relational issues uh, that is created by this COVID-19 crisis? And I've mentioned this to you before, that while the doctors and while the scientists are, are working on curing the virus on, uh, or vaccine, um, I'm here, and I want to try to help you each week to handle the dis-ease, the stress that, that's caused by the pressure of, of all the changes of this crisis. And I'll tell you folks, it, at times it feels like it changes every day. And many of us have had our lives turned upside down. So my last message last week, we called that a faith that leads to emotional health, and I told you that we were going to go through uh, 10 principles uh, that lead to emotional health from the Word of God to help us stay healthy in our minds. I believe that God cares all about us, uh, body, soul, and spirit. And I know you believe that too. And uh, so I gave you the first five of those principles last week. In just a minute, we're going to review them. And uh, today we're going to go with the next five to bring completion to that. And uh, what I want to do today is quickly review the first five, and then we'll share the final five. And I want to encourage you, if you missed last week's message, to go on to our website, freshwindchurch.net, freshwindchurch.net, and click the button that says watch. And then if you scroll down, you'll see all the messages from this series on demand there. And you can just click it and watch it right there. We 
we I even put the a little button for you to download uh, the message notes for each message. So we just want to be a blessing to you. Now, for review from last week, first principle for emotional health in a crisis from the Word of God is this: uh, to show grace to myself and to others. Show grace to myself and to others. So, in other words. To make it through this crisis, you got to treat yourself and everybody else the way that God treats you. Now, how does God treat you? Well, I think if we were to be really honest, we would have to say that God has been gracious to us, that God has been merciful to us, that God has shown us forgiveness, and we have to admit, folks, every single one of us, that God cuts us a lot of slack. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if I'm the only one in here, but there have been times in my Christian walk when I've blown it big time. I see a lot of people nodding in agreement. You're all tracking with me. That's good. We have to treat ourselves and we have to treat others the way that God treats us. So the first part of this message, I talk to you about being kind to yourself and not expecting to be able to operate at the same level of efficiency and energy that you did before this crisis. Uh, we're, we're in a draining time right now. And we, we talked last week about how in crisis that your reserves are, are drained every day and this continues. Emotional, spiritual, physical. Everybody's having a tough, a tough time so we need to be kind to everybody. Remember that when you go out to the stores to buy groceries. All those other people in the store with you are going through the same feelings that you are. And there's not much kindness out there. You be the one to show kindness. You be the one to reflect the love of God. And then the second principle that we looked at was this. Start and end each day by refueling my soul. I talked about how your soul is your mind and it's your will, it's your emotions. You're not just a body. You have a soul, a soul with a body. So how do, you, how do you recharge your soul? You do it by getting into this book. This is, this is soul food. It's God's word. And you begin every day by reading a short portion of the Bible. We call it God's word first and God's word last. And, and I hope that, that you've been trying to put that little spiritual uh, habit into, into place in your life. So the first thing you do every morning is you have your Bible open on your nightstand and you read a short passage until God speaks to you. And then at the end of the day, you go back to that open Bible right before you lay down. You read it again so that the Word of God is getting in you the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night before you go to bed. I'll tell you folks, I met a lot of people over the years that struggled with uh, nightmares and things along that line. You can fill your mind with the Word of God before you go to bed. Guess what's going to happen to your nightmares? They're going to go down. God's word first, God's word last. It's important. And you'll have a lot more emotional stability in this crisis. Thirdly, I said that we need to uh, set and stick with a routine. We went into detail uh, talking about how predictability, it's an important stress reducer, especially when everything's unpredictable. Um, I have a, a cousin in England who has just had to re or close his uh, business once again because of the lockdowns. When there's so many changes going on around you by the day, that routine develops resilience. That predictability uh, creates stability in your life and the structure creates steadiness. We talked about some practical ways to uh, build a routine into your life. Number four, this one's a biggie. Stop watching so much news. You need to monitor your media intake. And why is that? Well, here's the thing. Uh, at once upon a time, they used to say, you are what you eat. And I think that can be amended a little bit to, be, to say now, you are what you watch. 
We tend to become whatever we watch the most. And so if we're constantly filling our minds with negative news, then don't be surprised if you go through life feeling discouraged and depressed and fatigued. So we talked about replacing that with some more positive things. It's a great opportunity. I'm reading this fantastic book by John Eldridge called uh, Get Your Life Back. And um, the last chapter I read, it talked about how in, in the time of crisis, it's a very good and healthy thing to focus on your, the incredible memories that you have. Memories perhaps of your childhood, memories of spending time with your grandma and grandpa, uh, memories perhaps of going on vacation, and all those good things that you love. When you get to focus on those things, it will help pull you, pull you out of the time of, uh, a time of depression. And then we talked about this fifth principle, and it's this, to schedule a daily connection with my church family. Whether it's just a quick phone call or, or a text message even. Refill your emotional tank by connecting with your church family and with the people that you love. And we gave you some practical teaching on that. So what I want to do is continue with the last five principles, okay? And then we'll be through. Uh, number six, and this one is an important one too. Share your feelings instead of stuffing them. Share your feelings instead of stuffing them. And I'm talking about all of the, the, the negative ones that you've, that you've been feeling during this time of crisis. And a lot of people, folks, are, are feeling anxiety and fear and boredom and frustration. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of talk about um, you know, maybe downloading the, the app so that you can find out if you've been in contact with somebody that has COVID. Now, that's totally your choice to do that. But what happens when your phone tells you you've been, you may have been in contact with COVID, with somebody with COVID? You're going to start dwindling into fear. God does not want you living in fear. Right. So I'm not telling you not to download the app. Just, just know it, it, it's bound to let you know that you've come in contact with somebody, perhaps. But you've got to keep choosing to trust God. You keep choosing to trust God. So you're going to, people are, are feeling anxiety and fear and boredom. People who are out of work and they're stuck at home. And then all of that leads to frustration. And I want to share something very important, so please listen. Feelings are meant to be felt. You hear that? Feelings are meant to be felt. They are not meant to be stuffed. Now, they're neither good nor bad. They're just feelings. And the only reason you feel, you ready? Is because you are created in the image of God. God feels. So we feel. You know, the Bible says God has feelings. The Bible says that God gets angry. That God gets jealous. That God gets frustrated at times with people. We also read uh, that, he, that uh, uh, he is patient. And I love the sections that says that God laughs. You know why you have the ability to laugh? Because God has the ability to laugh. And God has an incredible sense of humor. And if you don't believe that, go home and look up the baboon on the computer. <laughs> All right. All the emotions you have is because you're made in the image of God. And they're neither good nor bad. They're just emotions. But when you swallow them, they're going to make yourself sick. In other words, if you don't talk it out, you're going to take it out on your body. People say, oh, my aching back. Oh, my aching neck. Guess why? I don't know, we're, we're all different, but I'll tell you, I carry my stress in my neck and my shoulders. And I gotta go see Dr. Mike once a month. <laughs> One of the reasons that you have pain in your body may be that you're swallowing your emotions and you're stuffing your feelings. I wanna encourage you folks, don't repress them, don't push them down, don't pretend like they don't exist. Express them appropriately and confess them to God. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, 
carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. That's a great verse. It means I got to share what I'm feeling because part of your troubles, part of your problems are the emotions that you're feeling. That's why we've instituted some small groups so that we can help carry each other's burdens. Now, how can I help you carry your burden if you don't share it with me? And in this way, it says you obey the law of Christ. Well, what is the law of Christ? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible says we're to bear each other's burdens. We're to share. So to, to stay healthy, you can't stuff it. You don't share it with everybody. Or maybe you need one person that you can be, hey, can I just tell you how I'm really feeling right now? And share it with them. And they're going to love you. And Paul gives us a great example of, of sharing instead of stuffing. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8. And this is the key to, to being healthy emotionally and spiritually. Here's what he says. We didn't know we did not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. Paul says, we're under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. He's honest, and he says, so that we despise even of life. Now, if Paul, who's the greatest Christian, uh, perhaps, to ever have lived next to Jesus Christ himself, if he could be that gut level about what he was going through, we can do it too. So who are you sharing your feelings and your emotions with? If you stuff them, you're going to get sicker and sicker. But if you share them, you're going to get healthier. Here's what James has to say, James chapter 5 and verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Notice he didn't say confess them to God, although that's certainly a good thing to do. But I want you to circle that word healed. You want to be healed physically and healed emotionally and healed relationally. You need one person to be open with and share with them your sins, your faults, your doubts. And folks, there's healing in that. There's healing in that. Now, if you're going to share your faults, your sins, it means you can also share your frustrations. And if you can share your frustrations, you can share your fears. If you can share your fears, you can share your feelings. Now, if all you want is forgiveness, then all you need to do is confess your sins and your faults to God. But if you want to be healed of them, the Bible says you've got to share it with somebody else. I want to give you a suggestion. You need to be aware during this time of uh, unexpressed grief in your life. Unexpre unexpressed grief in your life due to this crisis. Because uh, you've already likely had a number of losses in your life due to this crisis. And a lot of missed opportunities. Now for my son, Bobby, and all others who went through grade 12, Graduated this year without a commencement ceremony. Without a prom. You get to grade nine, and you dream of the day when you get to walk across the stage and get your diploma from your principal and graduate in front of your family and your friends and your teachers. And that dream got shattered for every grade 12 school. For the students in here, maybe if there's students watching, if you haven't grieved that, you need to grieve it. You need to get it out of you. Some of you perhaps weren't there for the birth of a child or a grandchild because of this crisis. Some of you couldn't go to funerals of loved ones because at, at the start of this, you could only get, uh, gather in groups of five. Missed weddings, missed graduations, all kinds of life experiences that people have lost out on. You need to grieve that. That's an okay thing. Grief is a good thing. Share your feelings with somebody else. Number seven, and this is a big one. It'll help you be more emotionally mature during this 
crisis. Seek advice before making major decisions. Seek advice from other people before making major decisions. Under stress, I don't have time to go through this in detail, uh, but under stress, I, your, your brain drops to lower levels when you're under chronic stress. What that means is you're not thinking your best. Not giving your best thinking. So before you make any major decision, it's pretty wise and pretty safe for you to perhaps check in with some other people. I mean, we talked about having a daily connection with your church family. That might be a good opportunity to have that connection. It's a good time to not make major decisions that are major on your own. Proverbs 15, 22 says, plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. You want to be successful through this crisis? Listening to good advice will bring that. If you ignore good advice, you're not going to make good decisions. When you're fearful, when you're upset, you cannot access the smartest part of your brain. And the more stressed and the more anxious you are, the more dumb decisions you're going to make. I love the Proverbs 11:14. it says, there is safety in having many advisors. So for your own spiritual and emotional health, get some help when you're facing a major decision. Get some other people to take a look at what you're thinking about doing before you do it. Okay, number eight, I need to space some renewal breaks throughout my day. Space some renewal breaks throughout my day. And those are times when I need to recharge. I intentionally refuel and recharge and refresh, and you need to space them uh, throughout your day. Now this is another breakthrough that uh, brain science is teaching us. Instead of, for instance, taking an hour-long break and you think, okay, I've had my break today, your productivity will actually go up instead of taking one long break. You take several five-minute breaks during your day. Now, I know at work that might not be possible. The studies have shown this, that this is the way our brain works. We don't need a long time to recharge. What we do need is more frequency in recharging. And it's good for our minds and our souls and our bodies. You need to ask God what uh, renews you emotionally. You know what recharges you, and then you do it several times a day. If it's playing the piano, or if it's working out in the garden, shooting some basketball, working on a puzzle, reading a book, whatever charges or refills your tank, shorter breaks taken more often will help you emotionally far more than one large break, and it's an important, important principle. So what you want to do is you periodically get up, you stretch your body, you breathe deeply, and you get outside. Nature is healing and it's calming. And I'm going to ask you to come and grab my phone because it keeps disconnecting from the camera. Thank you. So what do I do during those refreshing breaks that I'm taking? One of the things you can do you ready? It's just talk to God. Talk to God. Talk to God during those breaks while you're walking or while you're doing your, your hobby. Here's a great promise. Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. It says, Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. That's called refilling your tank. That's recharging your battery. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and will not faint. That's called emotional health. And that's spiritual health. And it comes from talking to God and from waiting on the Lord. And you can do that when you take these breaks. I'll show you another great verse. Isaiah 58 verse 11. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like, a, like an ever-flowing spring. Are you feeling a little emotionally dry right now? 
God says, I will water your life and keep you healthy. You'll be like a well-watered garden. God doesn't want you to dry up during this time of crisis. And I as your pastor who love you. I don't want you to dry up during this time of crisis. God wants to refresh you, but you've got to spend time with him. I want to issue you a challenge. If while you're watching something on TV to, uh, this week, or if you're reading something on your social media this week, and it just gets you a little bit irritated, you ever do that? You ever watch something, you see something, you're like, oh. Take 30 seconds, just shut off the screen and take 30 seconds and we'll give it to God. Let it go and give it to God. All right, number nine, and this is important. I need to serve someone who is suffering more than me. I need to serve someone who is suffering more than me. We look around, folks. Yes, we're all in a tough spot right now. But if you really do some searching, you're going to find someone who's in a worse situation than you are. And so for your own mental and emotional health, we got to get the attention off of ourselves and focus on somebody else who's hurting more than we are. And you need to give back. And you need to make a difference. See, it's, it's not about you. And it's not about me. My life is not about me. And we know it's all about Jesus Christ. And so one of the secrets to being healthy during a, a big crisis like this is to step outside of our own self-centeredness. James talks about helping the most vulnerable people many times in the book. But I want to read you one verse. We'll come back to this. In society, James says that the most vulnerable people are, are orphans. That's people who don't have parents. They're widows. Elderly, single adults. He said they're the most sidelined, the most vulnerable. James 1.27 religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. He's talking about public charity and private purity. Public charity and private purity. Help people who are needy and keep yourself pure. Now, very shortly, we enter the Christmas season. I can't believe that we're already talking about Christmas. Anybody listening to the songs yet? A few people? The rest of you, don't judge. <laughs> so I talked about being open and sharing. Emma and I listened to some Christmas music on the way in from Walton this morning. Well, we warmed up our voices too. <laughs> so we're entering Christmas season. Uh, as Andy Williams sang out in his songs, it's the most wonderful time of the year. But for many people, it's the loneliest time of the year. And people who are needy feel it especially harder at Christmas time. And that's why starting today, for the months of November and December, I want to start up our Blessing Bag campaign once again. That's what they look like. We have a few at the back there. What you do is you take this bag and you go to the grocery store and uh, you fill this bag up with groceries and then you go and randomly bless people. Or maybe you take, take a bag and drop it off at somebody's house. Or if you know of a need, you take a blessing bag to them. Fill it up with groceries and take a blessing bag to them. And we're not doing this to pat ourselves on the back. We're not doing this... Uh, to make a name for ourselves, we are doing this to spread the love of Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus Christ. I think that we as a church can bless the socks off of this community over these next couple of months. Now, as you do this, you're going to notice two things. First, you are going to bring some light and some hope to a person in the name of Jesus Christ. 
And then second, as you take the attention off of yourself to help somebody else, you will find that your soul is recharging and refreshing. It feels good to help. And there's many, many promises in the Word about this, but here's one. Proverbs 11.25 The generous will prosper, but those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So you want to be refreshed yourself? Start refreshing somebody else. Look for somebody to help. Be a servant to others. Such an important principle. Let's be the church that blesses this community this year. And then number 10. Last one. Control what's controllable and trust God for the rest. Control what's controllable and trust God for the rest. Now both of these are important. God has a part in your mental and spiritual and emotional health and you have a part as well. Now God isn't going to control the things that he's given you control of. God gave you a lot of his will when he gave you your brain. And he gave you a brain with the ability to make good choices. And he gave you a will to choose. And he expects you to make wise choices. So what is, what's controllable? The things that you have a choice in. Now, a lot of things you don't have a choice in, but the things you do have a choice in, those are controllable. For instance, you can control when you go to bed at night. You can control uh, what you eat. You can control when you get up. There's lots of things that you can control. And those are the choices that's your part in the bargain. You control the controllable. But then you let God handle the stuff that you can't control and you just sit there and trust Him. Now James says a good example of this, the balance between God's part and my part. James 2, this is from the New International Version, he's talking about Abraham as an example, verse 22, referring to Abraham. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. God is faithful to do his part, we need to be faithful to do ours. This is true in any area of our lives. Let's say that your struggle is with uh, smoking cigarettes. And you say, well, Pastor Jay, I just can't quit. I've tried and tried, but I can't quit. You're right, you can't. You need God's help. But what this means is you pray, you ask God to help, and then you make the decisions to, shut, to uh, flush those filthy things down the toilet, and then God will be faithful on his part to fill you with power. And then you're free. And it's true in any area of life. God is always faithful to do his part. Always. We need to be faithful to do ours. I want to be honest with you. It's easy to go to some extremes here. They say, well, I'm just going to trust God. And then you, you become passive and you give up your humanity. I'm just going to trust God. And then you use it as an excuse to do nothing. On the other hand, the other extreme is, well, if it's to be, it's up to me. <laughs> and you act like God doesn't have any part in it. It's all on you. Passivity is wrong. Depending like it's all on me is wrong. Faith and action work together. Faith and action work together. We're going to come back to this when we study this in depth. When James talks to us about uh, the balance between God's part and my part in staying healthy. The first book of the Lord of the Rings trilogy written by J.R.R. Tolkien, there's a moment where uh, Frodo complains about all of the evil and the pain in the world. You found yourself doing that lately. 
And he's upset about it, and he says this, everybody's experiencing this evil, and everyone experiences pain in this day. And he's complaining to Gandalf, and, he's, and Frodo says, I wish the ring had never come to me. He saw all the pain in Middle-earth because of the ring of power. He saw the enormity of the task before him, and he was overcome with anxiety. And you may be saying that about this crisis, I wish it hadn't happened. sitting there on the couch in a moment of frustration and you look at your spouse like I've done with Elisa, tears in my eyes, I wish you would stop. You might be saying about that about this crisis. I wish you would just go away. And in the book, Gandalf wisely and sympathetically responds to Frodo. He says, so do I, Frodo. And so do all the people who live to see such times. He says, but it's not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the times we've been given. All we have to do is decide what to do with the time that's been given to us. There's a lot of things in your life right now that you have no control over. None of us have any control over this crisis. Absolutely zilch. You also can't control how the government is, is, is dealing with it. If there's an election, you have an opportunity to bring about some change. And until then, we got to pray. We don't have any control over that. And there's a lot of different things that we can't control. You can't control the circumstances of life. But here's one thing that you can control. You can't control how you respond to the circumstances of life. You choose how you respond. And so if you put these 10 principles that we looked at last week and this week from the Word of God, when this crisis is over, and folks, you try, just mark my words, there is going to be an end to this. Yeah. Yeah. That when it's over, you'll be a whole lot stronger. You'll be more dependent on God. You'll be a person of sterling character, a person of incredible faith, emotionally healthier, spiritually more mature, and that's all your choice. You get to choose how you respond. And here's the great news. You don't have to do it by yourself. Jesus Christ is waiting to help you. You don't have to do these 10 things on your own. Certainly not on your own power. Jesus will be your savior if you let him be your savior. Every week we close by doing a few things together. The first thing we do is, if we've never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that we do that, that we settle that right now, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching online. The most important decision that anybody could ever make in their life is the decision to say yes to Jesus Christ. No, I'm blessed to have my parents visiting with us. They're going to spend that afternoon with us. Back in 1984, my mom and dad absolutely hated each other. <laughs> She's sitting there, amen. <laughs> 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 Amen. My dad was an alcoholic, chain smoker. My mom, they just didn't mesh well together. I believe that uh, had the Lord not intervened, maybe they would not be together right now. And the place where my mom worked was owned by boring in Christians. And they gave her free tickets to go see Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames at the Pentecostal Church of Coco. One, one day my dad came home from work and in those days he was a uh, foreman at the, at the uh, dye house at Wabasso in Wallam. He come home with his overalls blotched in different colors of dye and he said to my mom, he said, let's pick up the kids and go see this play. And we went. And we saw, I think, I saw for the first time the love of Jesus through his death, the power of Jesus through his resurrection, and, and the reality of heaven and hell. 
I was, believe I was eight years old at the time. There was a part in that play that involved a drunkard. I don't know who the actor was, I can't remember. But when I looked up there, I saw my dad. And so at the end of the play, when they gave the altar call, I didn't ask my mom and dad for permission. I got up and I ran. And my little sister joined me and then my mom. And then a moment later, my dad came up and slipped his hand into my mom's hand and that night we gave our hearts to the Lord. Amen. God has changed our lives. Amen. An absolute, complete miracle. There's no greater miracle than a soul saved. Right. And I thank God every day. Thank you for saving me. I believe this November my parents will be celebrating as a 48 or 49 years of marriage now. God is so good. Maybe you're here today or maybe you're watching online. You've never said yes to Jesus. Why not do it right now? Second thing we do is for those of us who are believers, we recommit our lives to Jesus Christ. And so what I want us to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to say a prayer. And uh, you pray this in your heart. If you want to pray out loud, you can. If you want to transliterated into your own words and do it. Those of you watching at home, you can do it right now. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment. Dear God, you know how empty I am. You know when my tank is low, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically, and I need to be recharged. And I need to be refueled. The Lord, I understand these principles that you put in your word. And I can't do them on my own power. Right now, I'm so tired. I don't know if I've got the energy to do these. I need you in my life, God. I need your strength. I need your power. Jesus Christ, I need you to save me. I need you to change me. I need you to empower me to be able to do what you've called me to do so that I can make the right choices. But I'm asking you to give me the power to do them, to fill me with your spirit and your love. I humbly ask this, that you accept me into your family. In the name of Jesus, amen. You prayed that prayer for the first time. I want to welcome you into the family of God. And then you to connect with me, either in person today or through my email, pastorjason at hereontel.com.ca. I want to connect with you. I want to encourage you in your newfound faith. For those who prayed that prayer today to recommit themselves to Jesus Christ, my only prayer is that, that this message was a blessing to you and that you will take these principles, apply them to your life so that you can grow. And then the third thing that we do together is out of gratitude to the Lord, we give back to God. The Bible talks about tithes and offerings. Someday we might do a message on tithing. Uh, it's 10% of your income that God reserves for himself. And if you're faithful to the Lord in that, he can take the rest of it and make it go farther than you could ever imagine. And then there's giving of tithes and offerings. And if you're here, you can put your gift in the offering plate or the, uh, the uh, tables in the back. 
or you can give by e-transfer to fwrcdonation at gmail.com. Be a blessing to the Lord. Amen. Well, folks, I'm so grateful that you were here today. I trust that, uh, that this has been a blessing and a help to you. I also just want to say thank you so much for being such a wonderful congregation. Uh, I, I pray, God, we have all my pastor friends. I love you. Have a great day. Kids, don't forget, take a bag of candy home, okay? They're at the back, not in the foyer of boxes.